Hi, welcome back to the Electronics Channel. And tonight I'm in my favourite place, the lab. On the bench we've got a Marantz NR1501 AV receiver that's faulty, it's got no output. Downloaded the service manual, we've got the unit, we've got a cup of tea. Let's see if we can fix it. Okay, so I've got the lid off and the first thing I'm going to do is try it out. So I'm going to hook up some speakers that I've got on the bench here. I've got a DVD player, you probably hear it whirring away up there in the background, uh, which is giving me a HDMI feed right here. And I'm also taking an analog feed as well, so we can check out the analog path through this thing. Um, so I'm going to plug all this in right now. So I'm going to go VCR in for the analog. There we go. Blu-ray in for the HDMI, and hook up speakers to the left and right channels. Okay, plug in some mains and let's see what we got. Okay, let's switch it on. VCR input selected, which is the one I've got the analog audio connected to. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, I've got audio and on both channels as well, which is not what's happening when I previously plugged this thing in, so that's a good start. So we're on Source Direct at the moment, so this is just the analog path through the unit. There's none of the DSP is involved in the Source Direct mode. Let's try going to the Auto mode. Okay, that sounds interesting. But it is passing some audio. Let's see if we can get different surround modes involved. Okay, ProLogic's not working. No, go auto. Okay, I seem to have killed it now. Let's go back to Source Direct. Lost the signal completely now. Oh, there we go. Back again. Oh, it's just faded out by itself. Okay. So we're getting a signal via the analog in. Let's go to the HDMI. I think I used the Blu ray one, didn't I? Let's try that. Okay, it's just flashing. Doesn't look like it can see an input there. I'm trying to unplugging and replugging that. Let's see if we can force a force it to resync. Oh, the light is static. No sound. VCR, nothing, so it's direct. Still nothing, let's bump it, does that seem to work before? There we go. So it is possible to get some audio through on the analog path, but there's something Something definitely wrong on the digital side, and it seems on the control side as well, because sometimes the path is there, sometimes it's not. So I think the first thing to do is uh, dive in and check some voltages. Okay, let's go ahead and start probing some voltages and see what we can see. So, let me get my multimeter on here. You might like this actually, this is an old Meritronic V540 multimeter uses Nixie tubes. So hopefully you can see that nice clear display on the video. Uh, let's go see what we can find on the board. Okay, so I'm going to strap the uh, 
going to strap the ground probe to the chassis. That should allow us to probe voltages with just one probe. This has only got a two pin mains plug on, so the chassis is probably connected to signal ground in this case and not mains earth. So we should be okay to do this. So let's turn it on. Okay, currently got a bit of audio coming through. So there are numerous regulators on this DSP board, uh, but there's also some incoming voltages on this upright header here. And it's labelled on the ground here, so it's nothing. We've got 5 volts labelled here. Yep, 5.04 volts. Good. And this one says 3V3 in. Interesting, 13.24 volts. So Yep, same on that one, which is labelled the same. So Either that's very broken or that's not 3v3. So we've got the block diagram here and that shows shows most of the regulation on this DSP board. It happens actually on the board itself. And I think this is an unregulated feed. So the one that's labeled 3v3 I think is an unregulated feed. So I'm just gonna scroll down to the schematic part and just check that. Yeah, 3v3n is labelled there, so it comes from a rectified and smooth DC bus, but it's not regulated at that point. And it feeds numerous regulators on the main board and on the DSP board. So I think it's probably okay that it's 13 point something volts. So we've got numerous little uh, 1117 regulators on this board, so tabs on those are normally the outputs. Let's have a look. 1.78, so 1.8 volt regulator, 1.79, 1.19, so 1.2 volts there, hopefully. Ah, 1.46, that's an odd value. So that's labelled as an L1117-1.8, so the output of that one looks suspect for a start. Another one over here, which is labeled 3.3, .3, and indeed 3.3. .3. That's the 1.2 we've checked. So that was labeled 1.8. One that one's labeled 1.8. It's 1.8. Okay, so this one over here is suspicious. It's quite warm to the touch as well. So I wonder if something strange is going on there. I think it's time to fire up the, uh, the scope and have a look at what's coming out of that regulator. Okay, so I've got the oscilloscope powered up now. Uh, I'm just going to connect the ground of the scope to the, to the chassis again so that I can do some probing without the ground clip of the probe, at least initially, to see what's going on. So let's have a look. Let's go for one volt per division. Uh, if you can't see this trace, I'll show you the close up if there's anything interesting there. Five volts coming in, which measured okay. Yep, yeah. it's reading just a tad high, but it looks pretty clean. Let's have a look at that 3v3, and which is actually unregulated 14 volts. And you see a bit of ripple on there because it's unregulated, but that's fine. Now let's check the other ones while I'm here. So this should be 3.3. Yeah, it looks clean. So this one's 1.2, that looks good, 1.8 looks good, 1.8 also looks good, so what we've got coming in, let's try the pin, okay so it's running on the 5 volt supply, good, okay let's have a look at this suspect 1.8 volts that we were looking at. Ooh, hello. 
Okay. Well, that doesn't look like a very nice smooth 1.8 volts, does it? Let's set this to trigger. Uh -huh. Well, we've definitely got a culprit. The 1.8 volt rail coming out of this regulator is oscillating. About 1.8 megahertz. You see this 1717 here is labelled as a 1.8 volt regulator. What we've got out is a somewhat interesting sinusoidal looking waveform. So the average is kind of 1.6-ish, 1.5-ish, oscillating at 1.8 megahertz. Okay, let's have a look at the data sheet for the 1717. Okay, so here I've downloaded the uh, Texas Instruments data sheet for the LM 1717, which is the regulator that we're having an issue with. And it does have specific requirements on the output capacitor. Um, it says the ESR of the output capacitor must be within 0.3 ohms to 22 ohms. So it would be interesting to see if there's something on this board other than these two small ceramic decouplers here because ceramic decouplers tend to have an ESR lower than that um, and therefore if you're only using ceramic capacitors you tend to need a special type of regulator that can cope with just having a ceramic decoupling this is not one of those so we'll go and check the schematic in a second and see if actually there are any other capacitors on the on the board here so it actually meets that requirement okay so the regulator that's uh, causing us a problem 1606 here is in the schematic here and it does actually have electrolytics on both the input and output as well as the ceramic decoupling so it probably does conform with the data sheet requirements but maybe the electrolytic on the output is aged or has dried out or something so it no, it's no longer offering the damping that the regulator requires and hence it's now oscillating so I think the first thing we need to change is the C1604 which is 100 microfarads 6.3 volt cap see if that cures the issue. So C1604 is the suspect electrolytic. It must be on the other side of the board because it's not showing here. So rather than take the board out and change that part, what I'm going to do initially is just tack another 100 microfarad capacitor on the output of this regulator. And if that capacitor has dried out, so it's causing a problem, that may actually help to solve the problem. So it may prove the point. So I'm just going to solder a 100 mic cap straight on the output of this regulator now and see if it improves or gets rid of that oscillation. It's quite hard to tap large through all components on tiny SMD things like this. So I'm do my best and see what happens. Okay. It's on there, so let's Switch on the unit. Mine's in, of course, something to help. Switch on. Okay, the analog path is still working. Let's have a look at this voltage. Uh -huh. There we go. So the oscillation stopped just by adding that capacitor. And we're now getting a reading of 1.78 volts. So it appear that regulator is unstable because one of the capacitors has probably dried out or aged on the other side of the board. So the final fix is just to take the board out, change that capacitor, which I'll do in a moment. But now let's see if the HDMI is working now because that's going to be the key indicator to see if there's any other issues here. So I still don't seem to be getting anything by HDMI. Okay, so fitting that cap in parallel has fixed the 1.8 volt supply, it stopped it oscillating. And now the unit seems to be passing analog signals absolutely fine. Um, I've actually brought in a different DVD player and hooked up other digital inputs. So we've not just got the HDMI, but we've now got coaxial SPDIF and an optical Toslink input, all from the same player, uh, and those all seem to work as well. Um, I can show you that actually. Here's the player that I've drafted in to help us out. It's an old Denon DVD 3930, 
it's got pretty much every output known to man on it, so it's quite useful for this kind of work. So let's go down here. So I've set the CD input up, I think is the coaxial digital, and we can hear that we've got some audio there, and it's coming through actually as Dolby Digital, so we can tell it to, yep, there we are, Dolby Digital coming in to channel. So that's good. I've set auxiliary one as the toss link input. So again, same thing, it's receiving fine, Dolby Digital. Radio's working fine as well. Blu-ray is still the HDMI input that I've got connected up. And although it's locked and stable, it's saying unknown stream. Sometimes it does say two channel, but most of the time it says unknown. So there appears to be still something not quite right with the... Ah, I think I've realised what I've done. <laughs> I think the HDMI is not switched on here. Ah, that would help, wouldn't it? Okay, let's see if that fixes it. Okay. Yes, there we go, PCM2 channel. So it's seeing the input and it's receiving an audio signal but there is no sound coming through. So there's still something wrong with the HDMI side of this receiver, but it appears that everything else is now working normally. So I think it's time to uh, fit this cap permanently on the bottom side of the board. And whilst I'm down there, most of the other signals that I need to check for the HDMI side of this repair are on the bottom side of this DSP board. So you can't see them from the top here. The only thing you can see is a buffer here that distributes the uh, master clock signal, and I've checked that, that's okay. We've got a couple of regulators that power the HDMI section, they're all showing okay as we've seen already. But all the actual signals that are interesting are on the other side. So let's get this board out and have a look at it. Connectors here are quite interesting, they're, they're quite tight to get out. So I think we're going to need the help of a large screwdriver. They do just pull apart, but they're just because there's so many pins, I just think there's a lot of tension there. Just have to be super careful. Okay. There we go. So our problem cap, I think, is this one here. It's be interesting to take that off and give that a measure as well. Okay, so we'll take off our temporary cap. Solves the problem. Flip over and just check that C1604, I believe, is the correct cap for the, uh, for the regulator problem. Here we go, I see 1606, and so the cap in question is C1604, which is indeed this cap, so let's go ahead and try and get that off. This one could be a tricky customer because of all the power planes and copper that goes into these power distribution planes and things, so Getting enough heat in here is quite tricky. I'll try and do this without damaging the uh, copper on the board. Might be one of those occasions where we need two soldering lines, I think. In one moment. Okay, 
Okay, we broke out the old weller. Let's go with the other iron. So let's see if we can get heat in both sides. It really doesn't want to come off. There she goes. Okay. Spray on there, remove the excess solder. See now if I've got a uh, suitable replacement. Okay, so I didn't have a direct surface mount replacement for this, but I have found a, a through hole version which I can use. It's actually 220 mics as opposed to the original 100, but it's suitable replacement, so that's fine. I pulled out my very old Maplin white gold uh, multimeter, part of the Precision Gold series, which I think it has some faulty ranges on it, but the capacitance range is still okay. So I'm going to try and get a measurement off this cat that we've taken off to see if it's any good. Okay, well there we go, 54 microfarads for 100 microfarad part, so it would suggest that that is aged and maybe dried out. Let's see what the 220 mic part that I'm going to put in measures. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and fit this part. So I'm going to put it right there, just on its side. So cut and shape the legs accordingly. Some fresh solder on here. in these ones as well. Okay, let's secure them now, that's good. Now what I'm going to need to do is find out which signals on this side I want to have a look at and bring them out on pieces of wire so that we can plug the whole thing back together but still probe the points of interest. So if we go to the HDMI section here. So that's the DSP. So here's the uh, HDMI switch IC. So you've got your different HDMI inputs here coming to this chip. This is a multiplexer effectively and gives you a single output. But it also produces, I believe, the audio signals here. So this is IC606, which is the buffer I told you about previously, which is on the top side of the board, right? Does it come? Right here. And that definitely had a 6 megahertz clock on it. It says it's the HDMI audio master clock. It's coming from the master clock pin of this IC. And that all, both of those signals there, which are outputs, buffered outputs of this IC signal, look good. So if the master clock's coming out here, I wonder if the serial clock and SD presumably serial data 0, 1, 2 and 3 for the different inputs, presumably are these signals here. So it'd be quite interesting to look if there's any signals on those lines coming from the respective inputs. So if we know which input we're using, which, which input corresponds to which socket, then we can put a wire on the correct one. So 
So the data lines for the Blu-ray, which is what I was using, are labelled as 3. So we've got D2 and they're all labelled as number 3. So number 3 over here is this port, which is port 3. So I'm going to guess that SD3 is the correct audio port for that. So I'm going to tack a wire on SD3 on the far side of the resistor. So I need to look for R1191, attack a wire on there, have a look. Actually, let's see where SD3 goes, because it may be easier to tap it somewhere else. So it comes into here. I think that's a video encoder chip. Yeah, there's the HDMI out. So I think this is a, an input selector, a multiplexer, and the audio goes through and into this chip, and then could be routed out. But I wonder if the DSP takes a single version, which is routed to the output from here somewhere, or whether it takes all four of those inputs and multiplexes them elsewhere. So there is an SPDIF signal here, but it does say SPDIF in. Let's see where this goes. It's the audio data on clock. So it's the audio data on clock comes in here. Okay, so SPDIF in does go into the 4588, which is the uh, serial receiver, ADC and DAC. So it's the codec chip that also has a built-in serial receiver for the optical and coaxial inputs. So that could be a good signal to check there, because maybe that's the way the audio routes through. But it's got to go to the DSP first, doesn't it? So that must be a bypass route, maybe. Studio audio set DSP sheet. Okay. Next to audio, here we go. Ah, right. So we have SD0, SD1, SD3, and SD2. So they're going into this 74LVC257. So is that some kind of selector? It looks like it's a multiplexer because it's got an AB control input there. Output enable. Yeah, so it's a two input, one output multiplexer with four parallel switches, it would seem. So it's selecting between the ADC and the serial data, and I think it mentions that up here actually. Yeah, so the control line for the 257s. If it's low, it's ADC is selected, and if it's high, HDMI is selected. So those signals are being routed through, and they come out at SDT0, SDT0, 1, 2, and 3. Up here we've got DSP bit clock, master clock, left right clock. Okay, so that would seem to be when taken on a bus here and goes into the DSP chip here. So we've got left right clock, zero clock in, and they've got data zero, one, two, and three. So it looks like all four data lines go through to the DSP chip, which is the CS497004 so it might be worth checking power to these buffers and also what the signals look like coming out of these buffers that would be quite a lot of lines to check though so again maybe we pick just the one the SD3 line and then also maybe check the LR clock and the bit clock. 
to make sure that all looks like a pucker audio signal. Okay, looks like there's a lot of wires to tack on here. So uh, I'll do that off camera and we'll come back and see what we've got. Okay, so I've now refitted the board. Uh, when I took it out and had a closer look to tack all my wires on, it turned out that a lot of the signals that I was going to tack wires on actually came through the board on vias, and some of the resistors were even on the top side. So what I actually ended up doing was just marking the points on the board with black dots um, and probing them whilst the, the board was in place, which made it a lot easier, which is quite nice. Uh, and I also tried overriding the switch control um, for those 257 selectors. Um, so these selectors here, it says on the uh, schematic here that low refers to the ADC input, so any of the analog inputs would, it should be low, and for any of the HDMI inputs it should be high. And I was finding that actually it never went high, regardless of what input I was selected or what mode it was in. So I did try forcing it high, um, and still got no audio output whatsoever. Um, but the signals on these buffers all look fine, the voltage levels were all fine, everything looked okay. So the only input that's not working is the HDMI input still. So now I think I'm going to start looking more at the HDMI section specifically because it would appear that the DSP and everything else is running fine. Um, so I'm going to bring a monitor in, check the HDMI out is working, check that we can route through the HDMI signal and we're getting video through and audio through. Um, and that will tell us at least that the, the basic HDMI circuitry is working. Uh, and if we still can't get any audio through at that point, then I'll have to start probing the specific audio signals for the HDMI pins um, and try and find out why this is not being, this multiplexer is not being set to the HDMI mode. So let's get a monitor in here and have a look if the HDMI switching is actually working. Okay, so here we are. We've now got this Dell monitor we hatched, which happens to have a HDMI input on it, connected up to the output and mounts. I'm currently set to the CD input, which is the coaxial digital, I believe. We're playing a, a DVD in the, in the DVD player up there. And sure enough, we're getting audio by the coax, that's fine. Auxiliary one is set to the uh, toss link uh, signal. It's also working. The radio is working fine. Okay, so this is the HDMI input now that's connected to that player. The monitor's turned on. Okay, so video. So video is coming through. We've got a solid light, so the HDMI connection is good, but still no audio. Interesting. Okay, so the fact that the HDMI section appears to be working normally kind of pointing towards this is a bit of an odd thing. So I'm going to try a different HDMI input, see if that, see if we can prove that the different one works. So I think we're on gain now. Okay. Yep, sure enough. There it is. Well, interestingly, it's still flashing. toggle between two inputs, back to gain. So again, we're still getting the picture, so the picture throughput's good. There doesn't seem to be any audio. Very strange. Okay. So, what I actually haven't done is gone through the settings menu on this unit. I wonder if there's some setting on here which is affecting the, the throughput of the audio. So let's see if we can get the I don't have the remote control, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to try and do this from the front. So, menu. Hopefully, you can see this. Okay, menu. So, system input. Let's have a look at the input. Uh, Blu ray, which is the input we were using. So, name Blu ray, digital input. Blank. So what are the options here? Dig one, dig two, dig three. 
They're the coaxial and optical inputs, so it's not those ones. So I think that's blank is correct. Audio mode, HDMI. There's nothing we can adjust there anyway. Auto surround, yeah, lip sync, fine. So that all appears to be configured correctly. Game, basically exactly the same, looking at that. So let's return. Speaker levels, channel levels, sound parameters, could be something in there. Night mode, dynamic range control, I think that means auto. Okay, Chronologic music mode, Neo 6 mode. I think these are just adjusting the uh, surround mode options, so I don't think it's any of those. So, system, subwoofer mode, normal, HDMI audio out, on. HDMI audio out, on. So, does that mean it's meant to be receiving audio? Or does that mean the HDMI output audio is on? Unfortunately, this monitor doesn't have an audio, you know, doesn't have a speaker system in it, so we don't know if we're getting audio via the HDMI out. Turn control off, home theatre EQ off, video convert off. So that's the only thing I can think could make a difference. Maybe the maybe the HDMI audio output being on means the audio doesn't come through the AV receiver, perhaps. Or maybe it's in a in a format that's compatible with the screen that you connect and not with the receiver. Strange, well, let's give it a go. HDMI audio out off. Okay, it would seem contradictory that you select off, but let's see if that fixes anything. Ah. And there we go. After all that, it was just a setting. <laughs> okay, let's just go back to Blu ray to check and that's still going to be okay. Check it works for all inputs. Yeah. Okay. So it would appear in the end that it, the reason the HDMI audio isn't working is just that setting, which is a bit curious. So it would appear you have to turn the HDMI audio output off for in order for the AV processor to decode it. So I'm assuming now if we check the line on that multiplexer, it will be showing high, which it wasn't doing before. So let's have a look at that. So the select line, I believe, was this one. Ah, there we go. 3.3 volts on there. If I go to one of the other inputs, zero. Blu-ray, nothing to start with. And then the signal finally comes through, there we go, 3.3. So that is now controlling the multiplexes as we would expect. So it would appear that that menu setting does make all the difference. Um, so in fact the only fault with this was the, uh, the regulator oscillating problem which we solved earlier. So a new capacitor in there, it's all fixed, ready to go. Of course there may be other dry capacitors in this thing because they usually dry out because of temperature and ageing. So it could be that other capacitors in this unit will be affected in time. Um, but at least if something else fails I'll know where to look first. But anyway, I hope you found this repair interesting. Um, certainly be a challenging one, this one. It's taken a lot of time to get to the bottom of that HDMI issue. Um, but yeah, there we go. All finished. All good. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like if you like this video. Uh, and there'll be more content like this coming up soon. I've got a few things already in the queue for the repair bench. So, yeah, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye for now.